So welcome everybody. Uh, Friday morning and uh, we come to the end of Wisdom's Chats for this week uh, and we're launching into looking at the power of words, the power of words and just that. So you can take it in whichever direction you want to and uh, so Edward I am going to start with you because you're, uh, I, I know Jasper's also an author, and I know that Leo is writing a book. So, uh, and, and so we've actually a little cohort of authors here, which is actually quite amazing. Uh, but uh, Edward, I think it would be great. I, I know words, you love words. So uh, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, this is a bit scary, really, because you've boxed us in previously by having a single word like legacy or trust. And now we've got this whole massive wide field of words, you know, so where on earth do we do we go? And you've given us no direction whatsoever. So, you know, I'm floundering about in this great maelstrom of, of stuff. Um, and you're right, I love words. And that was something my grandfather gave me. Um, and he also used to love puns and really bad jokes. And I inherited that from him. So that's the legacy that he left me. Um, and I think I'm really lucky to, to, to live in England because the English language is a really rich language. And it also, it can create new words. So whatever situation comes along, it can create new words. Whereas some other languages can't. For example, French. French can't create new, you know, the French language can't create new words. And you might not know, but the French don't like the English and we reciprocate. Um, but I feel really sorry for French um, commentators on athletics because you know, the French are very excited and very voluble and you know, they get really passionate about stuff. And could you imagine some, um, some French commentator, he's at an athletics event, there's a big race coming up, the 100 metres, and he's going really at it all about how fantastic the athletes are and how they're representing France and they're going to be so great. And he says, you know, il met ses pieds dans la starting blocks, because the French haven't got a word for starting blocks. It must really kill them to have to use an English word for starting blocks. Oh. And, and that's why I love English because, you know, we've got so many words and, and also we don't mind as well whether we take words from somewhere else and adapt them and use them because there's plenty of French words in the English language. Um, but words are about communicating. And I think, you know, to communicate is, it, is to impart information and, and, and to convey a sense of understanding. And if you use the wrong words that people don't understand, then you're not doing that. You're not imparting information. You're not communicating. So if you use big words when um, the people don't understand those big words, you're not communicating. But if you use the right word that someone understands at the right moment, that enhances communication. But also, if you use simple wrong words with sophisticated people, you're not going to communicate either. If I say, like, yeah, you know what, mate, done it, in it, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. You know, so for me, it's about choosing those right words. And just broadcasting words without thinking about who's receiving them is to misuse the language. Um, but sometimes there are words that just capture what you want to say. And they just say it all in a few words. And I don't know whether you, whether you um, knew that a little while ago, the model Stella Tennant, Tennant died. I don't know if you come across her. She was she was a supermodel, um, and, and and she died recently in unfortunate circumstances. And the broadsheet newspapers, they're the, the serious newspapers in the UK. 
they described her as having an androgynous insouciance. I can never say that word properly. But that described her perfectly. You know, androgynous described her physically because she was neither female nor male in looks, but she was stunningly beautiful. Oh, I seem to have frozen. Can you still hear me? Because I froze for a bit there. Yeah, okay. Um, so that described the beauty. And in, insouciance, really, it, 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 it's a, a word that, that, that has lots of elements to it. It's like a cocktail, um, a very complex cocktail. So it means carefreeness, nonchalance, indifference, detachments, cheek, nerve, sauciness. And that's just the high notes. There's lots underneath it. And that described her beautifully and perfectly. Um, so it was fantastic. And, and, and I realized then that, of course, if you don't know those two words, then that beautiful moment falls flat like a deflated souffle. So it really depends on knowing your audience. And then there are some words that we that we borrowed from the from, from say German that just do the job perfectly, like Zeitgeist. And, and, and South Africans have lots of words that um, uh, match the situation perfectly. And I think in Yiddish, there are some words in Yiddish that are just it. Um, but the word I really love from the German is Schadenfreude, which means finding pleasure um, in others' misfortune. It, it's a perfect word. And, and that describes me beautifully when I'm listening to the traffic reports on the local radio and I hear about people stuck in a traffic jam. And, and for Leo's benefit, Leo, I gave up using a car at the beginning of 2019. Um, and so when I hear people stuck in a traffic jam, that is schadenfreude. Absolutely fantastic. And I think also words, words as well as having beauty, they're dangerous. They can be used to harm people. They can be sharp sticks that we use to punch as people's balloons of hope, of dreams. It can take just a few words to destroy someone, to destroy someone's hopes for the future. So yeah, I love words, but I, I, I try and use them carefully so I don't hurt people, so I don't confuse people. But when I find that, that perfect word it is such a beautiful moment. Unfortunately, the way to describe it is using the French, bon mot. So that's me. I'm so glad we record these these wisdoms chats because that was just so eloquent and elegant. Thank you, Edward. Really, really appreciate that. And Thank you. I'm going to come across to you because um, I think both you and Jasper, because you speak Dutch, don't you? Or, or a little bit of Dutch. Uh, so I was just thinking about um, comparing words, but you, you share your, your story of the power of words. You talking to Jasper or me? To, Le to you, Leo. Uh, sorry, cool, cool. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to ask um, if you could, in your notes, um, ask Edward how to spell that second uh, word after androgynous. I didn't quite know what how the, how the word was, so if, if you could do that, please. Okay, yes, I, I am Dutch. My parents are, are from Holland. I'm first generation South African. Um, and, and Dutch was our home language and not English, but I did go to an English school. So um, with all the challenges that came with that. Um, so for me, the word today, um, I, I had one word uh, before this morning and now I've got two words. So if, I'm going to give you the second word. But uh, the first word is, is from Chris Burtish. Uh, and he... His word on his on his boat paddle paddle board paddle thing um, was, "I'm possible." And actually, uh, you know, if you put it all together, it's impossible. But but he he separated, made a separation, and and it became, "I'm possible." 
And, and that was for me particularly meaningful um, at a time. So he, he, he did this uh, transatlantic uh, paddle, stand-up paddling thing uh, about three or four years ago. Um, and and I, I was just going through a challenge in terms of how do I, uh, you know, uh, I was trying to make something happen and it didn't happen and it all fall, it fell apart. And, and I was following his journey, which kind of just seemed so impossible. You know, I mean, this, this standing up, paddling across the ocean. I mean, which idiot will do such a thing? And, and, and I mean, it just, I mean, Everest seemed easier, you know, um, and, and, um, and, and he did it. And, 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 you know, I followed his journey over 93 days uh, um, and all, obviously all the preparation. And so the phrase I'm possible became quite meaningful for me uh, as a, as a slogan that says, well, you know what, Leo, you know, tough times are there, but I'm possible, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so, so yeah, that, so that was my one word. And the second word is launch. So this morning, I mean, I've been awake since quarter past two. So, and I tried to go back to bed at half past five and that didn't work. And so again, I got up again and, and at, at 5.53, Mentally, after taking lots and lots of no notes and everything like that, I have mentally launched my business. So before today, it was just an idea that I've been trying to put together and 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 and, and, and figure out the pieces. But mentally today, at seven minutes to six, I launched my business, and. So that's going to be a, a, an interesting date for me. And so uh, that's a mental launch. Then a pre-launch launch will be the 1st of March. And then the launch launch will be the 1st of September. So I've got all that figured out. And so for me, the word launch, it, it, you know, it kind of shifts idea and, and concept and and is it possible to write? It's now we're going to now do it um, mentally, and you know. And I'll invite you guys to the pre pre launch, <laughs> and, and and share share it all with you. I'm, I'm meeting with Jasper this this afternoon, and and hopefully he can help me um, put it all together. Um, but so so what I what I find exciting about launch, you know, when you when when the ship has been built. And, and, you know, you have the queen or the, you know, a dignitary coming and throwing this bottle against the, the bow, you know, if that's even the right word. Um, the ship is launched, you know, into, into the water. And, and I think launch is a, is a powerful word um, in terms of, of the beginning of a creation, you know. Um, yeah, so that's me. What an amazing <laughs> because it really, really does illustrate the power of words that a simple word like launch creates a mindset and a change of a shift that moves, as you say, from concept to reality. And uh, that's that is powerful. Thank you, Leo. That was really, really brilliant. Uh, so, Jasper. Uh, share, share a little bit from your perspective, the power of words. I'm morning. I must say I find uh, the, the dynamics uh, and the life that's in these kind of sessions uh, fascinating because uh, you put a topic on a table, uh, but then as it unfolds and, you know, there's even dy uh, dynamics in who do you start with as a speaker? Because that can set the tone. Because invariably, who, 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 whatever speaker comes first, he tends to trigger your thinking. So whatever you prepared is then enhanced and you're also reminded of something else and something else. And uh, you know, I, was, uh, I appreciate that, that both Edward and Liu then uh, focused on specific words and why those specific words uh, gave them meaning. Uh, I must admit in my preparation or my, my thinking about the whole thing, I wasn't 
I didn't start off by thinking about specific words, uh, but I do like, and I made a note, I like that I'm possible. Uh, I, I, I like it, it's a powerful word. Uh, but that made me, re that reminded me of how a simple word like mindset uh, jumped in my spirit in 2008 and how it changed the course of my life. And for that matter, uh, start, is starting to impact on many, many people. So uh, mindset, you know, we have to play on the word impossible to become impossible, then mindset. Uh, set is fairly firm, it's permanent, it's set. Um, and uh, in what is your mindset? Uh, so uh, I think uh, for me, it was a, a revelation of, of the possibilities that if I think generational and I set my mind on generational, uh, how it impact the way I do things, the way I think, the way I build relationships, the way I think about assets. I oh, sorry, you muted me. Uh, not a problem. Uh, so so uh, yeah, so so the word that I'll probably put on the table is one of the words is the mindset. But before I get to other words, I was just thinking of the power of words being spoken, but then uh, in the the spoken word, it's not just the word itself. And I think uh, a master of it is, 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 is uh, uh, Trevor, that you can say a thing that you might be offended by, but then he gives you a wink or whatever. And all of a sudden you think, you realize he's not, he's, he doesn't mean that word. He is actually saying the opposite or something to that effect. So, so words, has power, but with it comes the nonverbal uh, uh, delivery or the package in which it is delivered. Um, but then I think uh, when it comes to words, it's a conscious choice. And I think I was only, well, I was uh, a number of things alerted me to the power of words. Um, I think uh, Anthony Robbins wrote a book of uh, the giant within you or something like that but also about enabling words versus disabling words. Uh, and with that, a enabling the beliefs with the, uh, disabling beliefs. So we tend to uh, verbalize uh, in our normal conversations what we deeply inside of us believe. And then if you find another person who then echo it back to you, that's what we say, the power of agreement. So the moment you and I agree about disabling word, that's it, that we have chosen our direction for us versus if I go around having enabling words and I get one person who agree with me on it, hey, for us, we will be brilliant, it will be a great day. Um, and I think the power of words for me is, and coming back to Edward's comment on why use these hyphenated words that nobody understand when Simple words conjure up images. And I think the best authors are those that uh, almost speak picture words. And as you see the word, you, you see the picture. I mean, I could vividly see that boat being launched uh, that you described there. Uh, so, uh, and, and I could even see that, that what androgynous or whatever, what is that lady? But I could see she's neither male nor female, and although she was beautiful, but uh, so words words create pictures. So I think that for me, the the conscious uh, reminder on a daily basis is I'd rather communicate little, but what I communicate must be enabling, and does it conjure up words of uh, you know positivity rather than just the negativity around us. Uh, and then I was thinking about words. Is it just the spoken word or is it, or is it the written word? And the, the fact is, once you've condensed a word into the written word, then it's, then it's eternalized. Uh, and here we have the Bible thousands of years after the first author started to contribute to it. And it's still a big guideline in my life. Um, but I'm thinking of uh, how young people 
don't understand the power of the written word uh, and also, you know, two things about the young people, it's the sort of language that they have uh, started to conjure up for social media. I struggle to follow some of the, the, the abbreviations that's now on social media. Uh, I think str I struggled for a long time to know what is LOL, and it keeps on popping up all over the show. And I think I figured out what is it, La laugh out loud or something. But there's so many of these things that quickly settled in a language, uh, whereas uh, it actually misses the mark for most of the people. It's, it's more a subculture. But then uh, I'm just thinking of how many people got into deep, deep trouble because of them uh, going on a verbal diarrhea on social media and typing out the words uh, that is offensive, be it racist, be it whatever. And now they, they can't retract the words, it's out. It's in black and white, and it's uh, circulating the universe. Uh, so uh, how quickly can we destroy our own lives just with uh, the, the misuse or the inappropriate use of words? Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm reminded of, of the old, I don't know if it's a South African saying or Afrikaans saying, but uh, you've got two ears and one mouth. So listen twice as much as you speak. Um, and I think the last word that I will just say that's my contribution is I find it very interesting and I work with a group of people that uh, we are very much aware of the mess in the world around us and we are very cynical about politicians' ability to do anything about it. Um, so what's the alternative? And, uh, you know, unless you're a, a very staunch believer, I'm not even want to call it a Christian, I'm talking about people who really believe that there's a bigger hand guiding the affairs of men, then that bigger hand uh, is also has good plans for us. So if we can just tune into what was his original plan and purpose and for us being created, so that comes back to the word history. And history can then also be saying his story. So I'm trying to figure out what is his story so that I can be part of his story, which will make me part of history. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Beautiful, Jasper. We, the play on words and, and it just shows you what words, uh, you know, you, you pull them and push them and they, 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 create a new meaning every time you investigate them a little bit more and uh, and I just I when I was thinking about this I was thinking about my own love of words and I don't know whether it's something that actually is born in you or whether it grew uh, but one of my early memories in a little village in Zimbabwe uh, was going to the library on a Saturday morning and they were two old librarians. They were certainly old in my eyes uh, and uh, we would have puppet shows and then they would read these picture books to us. Um, literally, we'd all be sitting on the floor and they would have a book and would show us that the, as they were reading it, we would see the pictures and I was entranced. It, it was a magical world that I inhabited in this uh, moment. And it, uh, for me, the library became a magical place. And that's where I started reading. I started reading lots of fantasies and, uh, and then I went on amazing adventures. Uh, and it was, a, it was a, an exploratory imaginative world that I inhabited with fully, was completely immersed <laughs> in, in these worlds. And, uh, and as I was thinking about that, I also, it's something that I've uh, passed on to my children. So one of the things that I did is I read out loud to my children as they were growing up, starting with simple books. And, and even as they grew older, in 10, 11, 12, uh, we were reading, I read the entire Harry Potter series to my family. So it was a family uh, experience. 
And one of the memories we go back to as a family is going on the train from Johannesburg to Cape Town. We just decided we wanted to go on a train trip. There was uh, rather than drive down. And, uh, and it's a 24 hour train, train trip. So you've got nothing really much to do. And I read uh, one of the, can't remember which one of them, but one of the Harry Potter books down. And, and, and then while we were in Cape Town, we had some terrible weather. So we were kind of indoors for a lot of the time. So, but no problem. We bundled up with, with uh, blankets and coats and little heater. And, uh, and I would read, read Harry Potter. And uh, so the, the, the richness of these words and the stories that they evoke and the experience becomes this, uh, as I say, magical uh, moments. And, and it made me realize the power of storytelling and, and, and that we, we talk about the written word, but our history is actually in stories in the oral tradition and that that oral tradition continues in families this you know we, we tell stories of what our kids were like growing up and they it helps them to understand themselves and to uh, so they these these oral traditions get carried on uh, and, and I mean, I, I've already spoken about it in, in this group is one of the oral traditions from my family is my ancestor uh, was a sailor from Portugal who got washed up on the shore of South Africa after uh, uh, being shipwrecked. Uh, and that's, we, we had a reunion almost 30 years ago and uh, of this huge Ferreira clan and we had a shipwreck party. We now we have photos of the shipwreck party because it's sort of built into the ethos of who we are. These uh, ragamuffin group of people that just invaded this land <laughs> by accident. <laughs> and uh, so words, oral tradition. And I've also recognized the power of words having done a lot of work in active listening. So I did training in active listening. I trained others in the skill of active listening. And, and one of the things that I when, I, when I was involved in, I would never call myself a counselor, but uh, like a first aid listener. I think that was something that I kind of saw myself as, is people in a place of just needing to get something off their chest. Um, and that when there was often a word that would get repeated over and over, uh, that was a, a sticking word. And if you repeated that word in a subtle way back to them, they felt heard. There was something deep within their being that said, okay, I, I've been, my, my thoughts, my feelings have been acknowledged and they move on they don't once you've said that word back it's like oh, I, it, okay i i i can something about that experience has been validated and it's a becomes a launching pad for them to move to the next stage of what they're thinking or feeling but until you say that that word keeps coming back, keeps coming back. And so it, it, it's again, the, the, the power of words to that we speak, that we listen, that we appreciate uh, about who we are. So that's all the serious side of what I wanted to say about the power of words. Uh, but Edward raised, and I just smile at it when he spoke about English and I don't know if other languages do the same. Um, and, and that is we make up words. And, uh, and, and there are experiences that sometimes don't have a word. So I've got this, I love this book. Uh, and you will, I think Edward, I don't know if it's in print, uh, but I know you would love it. It was written by some British guys. It's called The Meaning of Lif. And I just want to read you 
the open, I'm going to read a couple of them, but I'll read you what the book is about. Uh, written by Douglas Adams and John Lloyd. In life, there are many hundreds of common experiences, feelings, situations, and even objects, which we all know and recognize, but for which no words exist. On the other hand, the world is littered with thousands of spare words which spend their time doing noth nothing but loafing about on signposts pointing at places. Our job, as we see it, is to get these words down off the signposts and into the mouths of babes and sucklings and so on, where they can start earning their keep in everyday conversation and make a more positive contribution to society. So they have taken words off the signposts from the British Isles, and this is now a dictionary of those words. So one example is the word Abilene, which is descriptive of the pleasing coolness of the reverse side of the pillow. Uh, then there is the word, <laughs> Ackle, A-C-L-E, Ackle, the rogue pin which shirt makers conceal in the most improbable fold of a new shirt. Its function is to stab you when you don the garment. That's an Ackle. Uh, and then there is a bodman. B-O-D-M-I-N, Bodman. The irrational and inevitable discrepancy between the amount pulled and the amount needed when a large group of people try to pay a bill together after a meal. <laughs> there has definitely had a Bodman in my life more than once. <laughs> Oh dear. So, and then I thought just to end off with what lif is, because it's called the meaning of lif. Sorry, if I can find L in the dictionary. Here we go. Lif, a book, the contents of which are totally belied by its cover. For instance, any book, the dust jacket of which bears the, world, the words, this book will change your life. <laughs> uh, so just to end off with a little bit of fun. I love that, Lee, and uh, Bodmin's a place in Cornwall. <clears throat> it's one of my <laughs> favourite places. It's, it's, a, oh, it's a town and a moor, and Bodmin Moor has the highest um, <laughs> peak in Cornwall as well. Oh, wow. Oh, isn't that lovely? So no, you'll never see Bodman quite the same way again. <laughs> oh, lovely. So uh, I'm going to open it to the floor. What would you like to talk about on Monday? Shall we just do anything? The, the, I was going to say the power of silence. Actually, Edward, I thought exactly the same thing this morning when I was thinking about this. I thought, actually, we talked about the power of words. I think it would be good to talk about the power of silence. So spot on. Thank you. That's what we're talking about on Monday. I was only joking. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, Leo, have you got, the got the a website for your business? Sorry? I said, Leo, have you got a website for your new business? Uh, no, 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 not yet. Um, this is this whole thing is is uh, very very new, and um, it was just an idea at the moment. What I've got at the top there is a is a working uh, title, you know, like they do in films. It's not going to be the title of of what I'm going to be calling it. Um, so there's still there's still a huge amount to do uh, before before I put a website together. I'm at the moment trying to put e uh, enough. Um, 
uh, sense together so that I, that it can become a presentation. Um, so at the moment, they like all sorts of ideas and uh, but that it's, 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 it's well on its way. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Power of silence on Monday. Go well.